want you to go with me back in time to Thomas Jefferson Junior High School, Monroe, Louisiana, on the corner, adjacent corner of the Minnie Ruffin Elementary School and with a big field in between and a whole bunch of happy kids. And one of them was a kid carrying a trombone case every day and walking back and forth to school. Of course, the distance has grown. I tell my grandkids I walk 10 miles to school each way, and it was uphill both ways. And, uh, but it really wasn't. It was only about seven blocks. And, uh, but Thomas Jefferson was the scene of many uh, uh, of the happenings in my life. And uh, I want you to go there with me this morning, and I want you to meet Harvey Killens, real person. And I want to begin my message preaching and talking about Harvey Killens. Harvey had a problem. Now, let me tell you what his problem was not. It was not the strength of his adversary that was his problem. And neither was it the lack of his own strength and power that was his problem. Harvey, in the eighth grade, was already a, a man in size. He was over six foot tall. He weighed over 200 pounds. And uh, that was in the eighth grade. And his adversary that was tormenting him every day, Brother Les, was half his size. He weighed 100 pounds soaking wet. And he was very, very much shorter than Harvey Killens, so that... Uh, my dad used to tease as I started growing, and most fathers tease their sons, and he told people that he stood on his tiptoe and shook his finger and said, you come down here where I can correct you. Hallelujah. And um, so I know about the teasing. But Harvey, his, his problem was, was very simple. He didn't know his own strength. He didn't realize how much power was in that frame that he possessed. He had never ever, Brother R.D., come to understand <clears throat> what kind of potential he had with his size and build and frame. I think it would be fair for me to say Harvey didn't realize who he was, and he didn't realize what he had. And it was pitiful, pitiful, the day I walked into the gymnasium at Thomas Jefferson Junior High. There lay Harvey Killens flat on his back. And perched up on the top of him, proud as a, as a peacock, was that smaller, weaker adversary. And his name was Mike Valerie. And Mike, Harvey was crying, tears just a-flowing. And Mike almost looked like he was sitting on top of a mountain or a hill, sitting up there wailing away at him and, and laughing at him and punching him in the face and and uh, cursing him and mocking him. And, and I remember when I walked in those double doors to the gym, I don't know how they got out. I wasn't in there when it started, and there really wasn't much of anybody in there. But, you know, Mike had enjoyed, Mike uh, Valerie had enjoyed picking on this six-foot, 200-pounder for everybody in the school knew about it. And when I walked in there and saw him, crying, laying there with one flip of his strength. He could have thrown that, that youngster off of him, and, and, and he could have done the damage of a grown man, but didn't know it. And he didn't have, he didn't have the, the mind that caught up with the body. And I wanted to, I wanted to scream at him. I did. I, I remember the feeling intensely. And as I typed this morning, I was describing the way I felt it. I wanted to say... Harvey Killens, do you know how strong you are? Do, do you know how big you are? Do you not know that you have more power than this little fellow has? And do you not realize that you're blessed with size and strength? What are you doing on that floor? Why are you allowing a weaker adversary do this to you? And why are you taking this abuse that you're taking? We've watched you around this school, and there are always 
picking on you. They're always calling you names. And now it's come to this. You're laying on the floor of the gym with a little tiny fella up on top of you, and he's wailing the daylights out of you. Don't you realize who you are? And don't you realize what you have? It was pitiful. And, and, and I, I didn't scream at him. I think I pulled him apart, and, and everybody went their merry way. But I wanted to say to him, that the one thing I really wanted to say, Randall, was, Get up, Harvey! Don't just lay there and let him beat on you. Get up and do something. And today I'm preaching on get up and do something. Get up and do something. Don't go down so easy. Can I get an amen? I'm not going to preach sad. And if you're not glad, I hope this makes you glad. Hello? Don't give up so quickly. Don't allow a weaker adversary to take advantage of you. Don't quit before you realize who you are. Don't stop before you realize what you have. Because who you are and what you have is so much more potent and powerful than who he is and what he has. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Get up and fight. Get up and point your finger in his face. Look, you know, what's that old song? I, 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 I've let y'all know last week I knew Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Now I'm going to let you know another one. But I, I remember when they used to sing, you got to know when to hold them, and you got to know when to fold them. You got to know when to walk away and know when to run. Huh? Thank you, Kramer. Hallelujah. And why, why in the world would a man of Harvey Killen's stature allow that to happen? And why? Would a Christian who's born again, who's filled with the Holy Ghost, who's baptized in the name of the Lord, who has all of the gifts of the Spirit at his disposal or her disposal, who in the world would ever think that anybody would just lie there along the roadside of life, letting the devil wail on them and letting him cause them misery and pain to the point of tears. I want to say to anybody here today that's deflated, that's lying on your back, that's been knocked down by something that has problems you can't solve, I'm not going to tell you I feel sorry for you because I know by experience that's what we like to hear. But that's not what we need to hear. What we need to hear is, do you know who you are? Do you know what you have? Do you know that the power you have is so much greater than the power your adversary has? Stop feeling sorry for yourself and get up off the floor and go do to the devil what he's trying to do to you. Somebody clap your hand. Get in his face a little bit. Hallelujah. Get up. Stop whining, Harvey. Stop sniveling, Harvey. Be who God made you to be. You're stronger than your adversary. You have power that your adversary doesn't have. You have gifts that your adversary doesn't possess. You have ability that you don't even recognize. Get up and do something. Hallelujah. You say, preacher, do you really need to preach that to a house full of people our age and knowing what we know? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Because I... I am a human. And every one of us in here are human. And there are things the devil knows how to push buttons. Hello? And he knows what button to push to intimidate and to frighten and bring fear. He knows what to do to make you feel no value. Hello? I know that he does that. And you know that he does that. But somewhere in between the tears and the feelings, we have to look around and say, wait a minute. On, in God's equation, Brother R.D., I am a whole lot stronger, a whole lot more powerful. I have a whole lot more in me than what this demonic spirit that's trying to take me down with depression and sadness and gloom and doom is trying to do to me. So I got to pull myself up off the floor. I almost picked this pulpit up. 
I've got to pull myself off the floor. And I have got to go and tell the devil, get thee behind me, Satan. Hallelujah. Because I have something you don't have. I'm a tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-filled, born again, Jesus' name, baptized, child of the Most High God. And he is my defense. Hallelujah. Somebody clap your hands if you believe it. Hallelujah. That brought back a lot of memories to me of Thomas Jefferson Jr. High. And, and when I see old Elijah in the Bible, I see him huddled up in the middle of a cave in the desert. I feel the same feelings I felt as a boy that day. Let me read to you. 1 Kings 1 and 9. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. Man, the devil loves to talk to you. Now, if he's never talked to you, you must be a true saint. Because he'll talk to anybody. He even talked to the master. He said, if you're really who you say you are, cast yourself down. Your angels will catch you. Turn these stones into bread. He'll talk to you. You can always know when it's Satan, and he will disguise his voice. Hello? But you can always know because what he tells you is going to be negative. It's going to be a downer. It's going to make you feel bad. It's going to question who you are and what you have. It's going to make you think you're less and not more. Not this less, but this less. It's going to think, make you think you're not more. It's going to make his voice is going to tell you you can't when you know you can. His voice is going to tell you that you are not when you know you are. He's going to talk to you. And when he does, if you let him get away with it, he's going to have you laying on the floor blubbering like Harvey Killens. With some little old thing got you down that you could handle in a moment if you could ever remember what you have and who you are and what's inside you. You could get up and rebuke it in the name of Jesus and walk on because you have power over hell. Come on, somebody. Mm. Jezebel sent a messenger and said, let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the life of one of them that died out there. By this time tomorrow. Now, you got to understand, this man had just called fire down out of heaven. He had just defeated the prophets of Baal. He had already seen God make it rain and scared his, his, his servant there with him to death. Amen. He had called down not only fire, but rain. And one little voice of a type of Satan says, I'm going to get you. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to take you down. You're never going to be what you thought you was going to be. You're never going to have what you thought you were going to have. Hello. You're a failure. You're a loser. You know, it's ludicrous when you back away or you've just been in a prayer meeting like I was this morning. It's ludicrous because then you, you want to say, you mean I let that stupidity get to me? You mean I let that really affect me? But at the time and in the moment, Jezebel's voice sounds like a lion saying, I'm going to get you. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to take away everything that's important to you. Nobody believes in you anyway. Nobody cares about you, Elijah. Nobody wants to hear you anymore, Elijah. Why don't you just, why don't you just hold on? Because before tomorrow this time, I'm going to destroy you. And when he saw that, he arose and went. That means run. <laughs> he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And he went a day's journey to the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested that he might die and said, It is enough, Lord, take away my life. Now, here's what I want you to see. He's there because the enemy had threatened him. Hello? 
You see, if you make an immediate wrong turn, you're going to have to deal with where you wind up. Hello? And so that's what happens with him. He's there because an enemy threatened him, and he's there because by now she has struck a chord in him that makes him feel alone and afraid. Huh? He's there because he's disappointed in himself. He's run instead of taking a stand. Hmm? He's let his adversary mock him and he's done nothing about it. He came to a place of fear and uncertainty, doubting himself. How can you doubt yourself when you just call fire out of heaven? How can you doubt yourself when rain came at the sound of your prayers? But the enemy knows how to strike a chord. There's nothing menacing about a 100-pound, barely five-foot little boy. But man-sized Harvey let that voice become so big in him until he wouldn't even fight back. Please, I know I'm preaching out of life, but sometimes we understand that better. I'm telling you, there are times the devil does to us what he should never have done because the first choice we make is the wrong choice, and then from there on, we're fighting for our life. Hello? And so he's fighting every, with everything that he's got because he's made a wrong choice and he's run instead of taking a stand. And his adversaries mocked him, and now he came to the place that he felt the weight of life drain him and bring him to a discouraged state. Anybody here brave enough to be honest with me and say, I have been discouraged in my life. I have been discouraged in my Christian walk. Might as well, you're human. And if you're human, that happens. Amen? But what I'm preaching today, because I knew that we had a short day and we were going to have a lot on our mind, I wanted to give you something to go away and think about and ponder. And you can pre preach the rest of the sermon out there on your own. Listen very carefully to me, what I'm trying to tell you. The old enemy brought him to a place of discouragement. And here's what you got to hear. In a state of discouragement, sometimes you pray the wrong prayer. Think on that. How do I know? That's what he did. He went a day's journey into the wilderness, verse 4, came, sat down under a juniper tree, and requested that he might die. Do you think for a minute, first of all, aren't you glad God doesn't answer every one of our prayers? <laughs> Hello? Doesn't it make you feel good that God understands discouragement? Doesn't it make you feel good uh, that God understands that you may not be as strong as the next one? And then it ought to make you feel good you can be. You can get there. Because God is no respecter of persons. Amen. And I'm telling you that he prayed that prayer. It's enough. Anybody here ever got on you and say, God, I can't take it no more. It's enough. I have. Nobody else wants to lift their hand. I will. I, it's enough. I've had it. I can't take it anymore. So if you're a coward, I'm a coward. <laughs> because I prayed that prayer before. But I came to understand something before I walked in here today. This man prayed that way because he didn't feel any hope. This man prayed that way because he was acutely aware that he was just another human in trouble. Huh? I mean, when you're up there calling fire down out of heaven, Brother R.D., you feel like a mighty prophet. But when you got some mean woman chasing you down the middle of the road saying, I'm going to kill you, hello, you, you, all your bravery leaks out. And now you just don't feel like you're a super prophet. You feel like you're just another human in trouble. Hmm? And you so and so it's kind of like my dad when he come in and he oh dad I'm sorry he, he, I'm telling off on him but he loved to, he loved to 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 hunt coon hunt at night with dogs and he'd go out with those dogs and they, those dogs they 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 were born to do one thing hunt coons and they didn't care how far they went and into what kind of mess they went into 
And my dad was one that if my dogs go there, I'm going there because I'm not losing my dogs. They cost me money. And you did not mess with dad's money. True. I'm going there. And so there would be times he'd come in at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, him and all the church men that went with him from hunting, and Mama would raise up groggily and say, Glenn, what time is it? And he told me this later with a grin on his face. He said, I told her, many minutes after midnight. He, she thought in her sleepiness, he said, 20 minutes after midnight. Many minutes after midnight. And sometimes when you're being chased by Jezebel, and she said, I'm going to kill you, you don't feel like a mighty prophet. Huh? You might get in this pulpit and see all kinds of wonderful things happen. But when you leave here, you got to go live life. You may sit in these chairs, and you may feel great. But when you leave here, there's a real booger man out there. There's a real devil out there. There's a real world out there. And sooner or later, it's going to cast fear into you and doubt into you. And that's when you got to have somebody come along and say, Stop laying there and letting him do that to you. Get up and do something. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. <laughs> he didn't see any end to it. He didn't feel any faith. At that moment. Have you ever had somebody to tell you, just have faith, brother, and it made you feel resentment? Huh? I've had preachers tell me that. It may sound like I'm just laying myself bare, but guess what? I'm as human as you are, and I've been there, done that. Someone tell you about it. Brother, you just got to believe. And I'm sitting there saying, do you think I don't know that? I know I'm supposed to believe. I know I've got to have faith. But right now, this is what's happening, and that's all I can deal with and see. And I need at this moment for somebody to help me with some of their faith. Hello? I need the Lord to come and, and, and make him back up a little bit. Leave me alone. Hello? Hello? Anybody here ever been depressed? Oh, here's one that you won't admit it. I will. Anybody ever been, when you're depressed, you don't want somebody coming telling you what you need to do. Hello? And I'm the world's worst. I'll tell you, come on, get outside. Let's go get some sunshine. But if you come tell me when I'm depressed, I'm going to say, leave me alone. That's because we're human. Hello? This man was human. He called fire down. He called rain down. And then he got a chariot that was chasing after him. And I don't know if it was adrenaline or what, Brother Jane, but he outrun that chariot. No, it was the strength of the Lord that helped him. But here he is now, and he said, I just want to die. And he, he couldn't feel hope and faith, and he saw no way out, and he, he didn't see anything that made him want to try again. I'm going to ask you again. You ever seen things that or not seen things that you prayed for that made you not want to try again? If you did, you're human. It doesn't mean you're not going to try. It doesn't mean you're not going to get up. It doesn't mean you're not going to do what you need to do. But in that moment that Elijah was in, he really felt like he wanted to die. In that moment. Hello? Hello? Now, here, here's what impressed me. I hope somebody gets something out of this today. He, not even angels visiting him and touching him could make him believe. Now, I've told you all this before, but if an angel visits me in the dark and touches me, I will get up, but it won't be because of faith. Hello? Hello? <laughs> but this angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. So he looked around and there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water. And the Bible said he took the blessing. Hello? Have you ever drug yourself out of your house and you felt, ugh? You went to church anyway. Hello? When you get there, there's, a, there's something baking on the coals. 
and there's something to drink and eat. And, and you didn't just turn around and go back home and give up and say, I don't need it. You took what was there. I have. Oh, thank God for the many times the Word of God has brought life to me. Thank God for the encouragement of a brother. Thank God for the reassuring handshake of a saint of God. Thank God for the Word that comes and puts life into the deadness of life. Oh, my, my, my. I, but, but here's what he did. This is what too many people do, and I'm teaching it because it's needed in our world. Amen. There was a cake. He took it. There was water. He drank it. He ate and drank, and then what did he do? He went right back and laid down in the same old thing again. Huh? By the time the angel was out of sight, he accepted the touch, he accepted the meal, and yet he laid back down right where he was before he got the blessing. I used to think about that a lot, Brother Fuller. I, I wonder, how could people come get such a blessing? I saw them get on, on Sunday, and by Wednesday, they call in me the most depressed and blue people because they're having a problem. I, and then it, I discovered, we're human. We're human. And this is what happened to him. And, and, and he was lying there. I'm going to say it like I feel it. He was allowing a weaker power to control his life and control his thoughts. Do you think Jezebel is equal to the Most High God? Do you think Ahab is equal to the name of the Lord? Jehovah Jireh? Amen. The Lord, our banner, the Lord, and I could go through all of them. Do you think they were more powerful than that? I don't think so. But God said, all right, I'm going to give him another angel visit. And that's what he did. All you got to do is see it in Scripture. I'm going to give it to you here in just a moment. Amen. God tried a second angel. But this time, he managed to get up, Sister Sarah, and he tried to follow God. I've seen people like that. They'll get up from what they're dealing with and try to follow God. But then, in his case, as it is in the case of so many humans, he found himself again when God took him to a cave. He meant to show him something powerfully victorious. But instead, he walks into the dark of the cave and lays back down again. Hello? Hello? Amen. And so he's lying on the floor of a cave, letting a weaker power take away his love for life. And the angel of the Lord came the second time, touched him, rise and eat. The journey's too great. He rose, he ate, he drank. He went in the strength of the meat 40 days and 40 nights. Came to a cave and lodged there. And then, while he's lying there in that cave, that's what, when he lodged, he was lying there sleeping in that cave. And here, the word of the Lord came and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I've heard this preach every way, and you, some of you have. Taking each word, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Hello? What are you doing? I've heard it preached that way. But here's what I got out of this. The Lord spoke to my heart. He said, what doest thou here, Elijah? He said, the problem is you aren't doing anything. Hello? You're being a, a quitter. <laughs> it got quiet in here. I know those are fighting words, but I want to stir you a little bit. You, you, you've given up without fighting. You're letting a conquered enemy rob you of who you are and what you can do. You got power. You're called of God. There's a mantle on you that you're going to share with somebody else in your future. You got anointing on you and you're lying here doing nothing. Huh. Get up, Elijah, and do something. Everybody say, get up and do something. You're greater than any Jezebel spirit. You have called fire out of heaven. You've defeated the prophets of Baal. You have more power than any adversary you face. But you have forgotten what I can do. 
You've forgotten what I can do for you. I can call fire down. I can walk into hell and take away the keys of death, hell, and the grave out of the hands of Satan himself. I can tell the sun when to shine. I can tell it when to move. I can tell it when to stand still. I can turn a stone into a missile of death and kill every giant that comes against you in your life. I have a name that is above every name. Everything in heaven and in earth and beneath the earth has to bow at the sound of my name and my blood can cleanse and render the death angel helpless. Hallelujah. Mm. Elijah, you have gifts. Mike Chance, you have gifts. Harry Haltimer, you have gifts. Chris Chesley, you have gifts. Hello, Sarah Jackson, you have abilities. Grace Stevens, you have God-given strength. Sister Marie, you have the power of prayer on your side. Hallelujah. R.D., you have what it takes. You're letting this happen, people. You're letting this happen. Don't lay on a cave floor and give up while the devil beats on you. Get up and do something. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. But Elijah said what Harvey Killen said. I'm almost through. Elijah said what Harvey Killen said. He did what Harvey Killen did. He started to whine. God, I got problems. I'm not making fun because I've whined. I've needed a little, what was that joke? Bread with your wine or something? Cheese? I don't know. He said, God, I got an enemy after me. They, they all trying to destroy me. The whole church is against me. Oop. They don't like me. Hmm? I'm, I'm tired of trying. I, I'm weary with getting pursued by all this stuff. I'm discouraged. I'm lonely. I'm by myself and nobody cares what happens to me, Lord. <laughs> and I love, I love the way the Lord handled that. You talk about a counseling session. This is, what, this, this is what he actually said. I've been jealous for the Lord God, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and slain your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord ignored it. And this is what he said. Three words I want you to not forget. Go forth and stand. Go forth and stand before the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. Stand before me, Elijah. I want to show you something. But before you can stand, you have to go forth. What does that mean? Get up and do something. Walk out of that dark place. Walk out of that dark spot in your mind. Go ahead and get out of this gloomy atmosphere. Walk out of this dark cave, this low place. Get out of this hole in the ground. You don't belong here. You're a child of the Most High God. Walk out and stand in the presence of God and let me talk to you just a little bit. Lord, have mercy. I feel that old camp meeting spirit coming on here. Stand. 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 My Lord, don't lay there. Stand. Don't go back to sleep in the same old mess you were in. Get up. Go pray. Go sing. If you don't know nothing else to do, just sing. If you don't know nothing else to do, call and I'll sing to you. Do something. Harvey, don't lay there. Lift one of those massive forearms and swat that little thing off of you that's trying to take away your joy and your happiness. Somebody has got to sit up and say, I'm getting up, devil. You better get out of the way because when I get up, I'm going forth and I'm going to stand in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 My, you know, what I noticed and learned from Harvey Killings, if you don't handle business, every kid in the school that ever felt weak in their life is going to come pick on you. 
And if we don't handle the enemy, every spirit's going to come try us out. So don't just lay there. Go forth out of that dark place, my Lord, and stand in the presence of the Lord. And when he got out of there, he saw the Lord. He passed by. Great strong wind rent the mountain, broke it in pieces, in pieces the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Listen to me. The commentary says Elijah saw a star storm. The place where he stood at, I didn't realize this, it's interesting, is called the pass of the wind. It was a natural pass through which the wind came, kind of like a place I've been in Golden, Colorado, right out of Colorado. I believe it's uh, right out of Denver or Colorado City uh, Springs, I can't remember, but I do remember that the hill's there and it's a pass and that wind comes often whistling down through there. And this was called the pass of the wind. And it was not uncommon for those winds to rage in that area. And the valley below which he was standing was called the valley of lightning. And the wind and lightning he saw caused a disturbance in the rocks. And when the rocks started moving, it caused an earthquake. Can I say it? It was nature. Oh, but God, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to make a good point here. It was nature. But he, anybody seeing that mighty display say, Woo, that's God. Huh? But here's what the Lord showed me through this. The movement of those rocks caused that. The lightning caused fires on the mountain. But the Bible said God wasn't in any of them. But he did say that he passed by. Hello? There are many people who want to assign glory to the devil and blame to God for the things that rock their world. And sometimes, people, it's just life. Hello? It comes alike to everybody. There's no new thing under the sun. Sometimes life can hit you and hit you hard. But here's what the Lord whispered to me. And I'm preaching it in the safety of this pulpit, and, but I do believe it from the deep of my heart. God was, was saying to Elijah, Elijah, not every outward thing that happens is God involved in. Hello? There's going to be some storms. There's going to be places where your life is shaken. The fires are going to rage in your world and the winds of trouble are going to blow. But if you want to make it through all that, you can't allow the things that happen that you assign to God make you angry enough to give up on God and quit. Because God is many times not in them at all. Hello? You can't let what happens to you cause you to allow an inferior devil to destroy you. God said, Elijah, I was on that mountain with you, but I wasn't in all that display. And I wasn't in all those big things that showed great power. That wasn't me. He said, I was in that still, small voice. My Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. And I found out again this morning that if you can just close the door and lock it, on all that outward stuff that's rocking your world. And listen real carefully. You'll hear a still small voice. And that still small voice, that presence that they sang about, that spoke in the inner recesses of your heart, Elijah, that was me. I don't know what that voice said, that still small voice. How many of you have ever heard it? Let me see a hand. I've heard that voice. I don't know what that boy said to Elijah, but it made him wrap his face. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face, verse 13, in his mantle. Whatever it was, he wrapped his face in shame and couldn't look in the direction of God. Perhaps he was reminding him of what he had done for him in the past. 
when he was standing on the line and all of those hundreds of prophets facing him. Let the God that answers by fire be God. Maybe God was, I see, because the Bible said a voice spoke. When he got up and he went forth and he stood before the Lord, a voice spoke and he wrapped his face. Wouldn't you like to know what God said to him? I'm going to tell you, sometimes when God talks to me, when I come out of those prayer meetings, I feel about that high. Now, God's not trying to diminish my walk. He's trying to diminish my flesh. So that He can speak to me the things that are going to make a difference in my world. Oh, I wish I could get it across. <laughs> Maybe He was saying, I'm the God that sent rain. I'm the God that gave you the strength to outrun Jezebel's chariot. And then... This was curious to me. He asked him the second time, What doest thou here? Second time. What doest thou here? He was telling Elijah, Bow your heads with me. Mona, you can play. I'm through preaching. He was telling Elijah, Get up, son, and do something. I'm the same God that I've always been. I'm the same God that you prayed to before. Sister Deborah, I remember kneeling by my Shanna's bedside, burning up with high, high fever. And I didn't pray some kind of a strong, magic, yelling prayer. Just laid my hands on her. My hands covered that little tiny body. And I prayed. And I could feel her body begin to cool as the healing came. There's been times in my life when I was facing much bigger things and the Lord would remind me, remember when I healed Shanna? I think maybe he'd been my, he might have been saying to Elijah, look over your shoulder, buddy. What I've already done for you, I can do it for you again. What I've been to you, I can be that again. What I've helped you with before, I can help you again. I'm the same God. Trust me, Elijah. Believe me, Mike Chance. Get up and do something. I'll help you. I'm the best friend you got. I'll fight for you. I'll answer you when you pray. You're bigger than this, son. That's what he was saying. Elijah, you're bigger than this. You can handle this. You're greater than this. You're stronger than this. Get up and do something. He asked him twice to put the emphasis on the doing. It doesn't matter what you do. We sang a song when I was a boy. We had to go to the radio station to do it on our radio program. And we'd stand in there and sing, If you'll take one step toward the Lord, He'll take two toward you. I feel that this morning. Just do something. Just do something. You may not know what to do. I remember the lepers that said, Why sit we here till we die? If we're going to die, let's at least die trying something. Hello? And they went down into a city. And God gave them all they wanted to eat and healed them of their leprosy because they stepped out first and believed God. I'm saying my message is very simple today out of eighth grade. Get up and do something. Return to your calling. Go back to what you're supposed to be. Even this, this blew me away, Brother, Brother Fuller. You'd think after God took the time to teach him all of those lessons, he'd send him into some great city and great, great move of God would break out. But no, he didn't. The Bible said, go, return on thy way to the wilderness. He sent him right back into the driest, hottest place. You know why? Because if God's with you, it don't matter where His purpose takes you. doesn't matter what His calling calls on you to do. If He's with you, you can return to the way in the wilderness. Hallelujah. And you can take up your purpose again. And take up the will of God in your life again. And you can be the overcomer that you have been. Even if it's in a wilderness.